worked at a couple of um, uh, a couple of biotech startups, uh, a couple of biotech companies. And um, yeah, so when I was doing um, you know, uh, FDA compliance and digesting human adipose, you know, tissue to get, you know, stem cells, I thought there had to be a better way. And so, you know, that's what came me, you know, to my creation, which I call Celerator. Let me uh, share my screen. And um, can everyone see my slides? Good. Okay. Yep. Um, yeah. So Celerator is just um, a desktop. I don't even know what you would call it, but it's sort of like a 3D printer for molecular biology or anything, actually. So um, my goal was the combat cost, you know, to um, make it democratize and repeatability was paramount. And so um, if you have any questions, please feel um, free to yell them out. I also, um, some slides have some red around them. This is when I asked the community some questions. So um, Celerator's a thief, not really, it's all open source. Uh, Celerator is built um, from open source. And then um, I used the farm bot kind of like a foundation. And then I kind of used like the open source ecology drive train. Um, I, I do like the, um, the Biohack Academy bench tools and some other, you know, open stuff. Um, so for starters, all technicians have a hand and they have an eye. And I think that's paramount for what my machine does. And so um, what I'm using for my um, device is a, um, well, I'll just show it to you in a bit, minute, but it has um, a hand that can interact with um, hand tools and it has pogo pins to send data in between those. It also has a, um, eight uh, megapixel camera that's attached to the hand so we can see what it's doing. And that um, is all connected. So here is the FarmBot universal tool mount, the UTM. So the reason I liked it is because it's magnets. There's no um, cam system. It's very low tech. And so um, I adapted their open source um, universal tool mount for mine. Um, I did add the... Um, the ports, um, I don't know if you can see the white 3D print, but those um, three gray ports are um, feed lines for water, gas, vacuum. I do have an RJ45 um, that connects all of the um, pogo pins that go from the hand tool to the bench tool. And if you see to the far left, I've got a uh, servo attached to the eight megapixel camera. That's all plumbed up through the, um, the telescopic arm. Um, here's a better picture. Now, here's the red question box for you guys. Now, um, using telescopic is fine. Um, the, it, the issue I have is with the umbilical cord. Um, as a group consensus, how important is it moving large quantities of water, vacuum, um, air, and, and so forth, you know, to a tool? So, uh, you know, filling up a bioreactor, you know, filling up um, a gel electrophoresis tray to make an agar. You know, I don't know. Does anyone have any opinions on this? Um, I, I want to abandon, abandon the idea of having um, water, air, and vacuum attached to the hand and actually make it a bench tool itself. So the idea is, is that Celerator will grab a water hose rather than always bringing a water hose with it. Um, any any thoughts? Any ideas? Sounds like something that you'd want to have the plumbing there for, and well, so I have the plumbing. The question is, is that should I always have water there, or should I just pick up the watering hose when I want to, you know, fill up the bioreactor and and so forth? I, I'm I'm thinking of you know moving this design from always having you know the fluid lines, you know, with the hand. So the white part is the hand, the red part is the tool, mm. and so. You know, the tool can be a watering hose. The tool can be, you know, a um, vacuum pipette or whatever. So um, I, I haven't figured that out yet. That's what I'm um, getting to. Um, and, and how do you um, maintain sterility? So um, right now, that, that's a question that's going to come up. I'm using the tindalization method where you're using a uh, sequence of um, uh, heat sterilizations. And I, I want to use all glass. So the idea is, is that, you know, using a pressure cooker and doing all these things fine, but my goal is low cost. And so I have a UV wand, which is a hand tool. And the idea is, is that the um, uh, accelerator grabs and it paints the entire um, build volume with the UV wand. And that will 
give you some level of protection. Let's go to the next slide. Um, I just have so, one thought about the, the hose question. Um, yeah. Like Keone said in the chat, I think it completely depends on the application. So I, I think I like the go pick up the hose because there are applications where I 100% want that and it's really annoying to use pipettes. And then there's applications where I actually prefer pipettes. It's, I mean, for bioreactors, we have like bulk media and then small additions. And they just, there's such a different scale that you kind of need both, but they're just separate tools. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay, so um, next is the drivetrain system. Um, this is version one. I'm at version three right now. But the idea was is that the, the form bot, what I liked about it was is that as you're growing, you know, fruits and vegetables in your little garden, um, it has a telescopic arm, um, which will go outside of the bill volume. So if you look at my um, 3D rendering um, on the left, um, I have a, a fixed Z axis, which goes up and down. Um, I like the design. It was really robust. It worked for all my needs. The problem is, is my next um, thing. Oh, this is, you know, everyone knows 3D printing, Cartesian co coordinates. Um, but so I've been using, um, th this is my version right now of enclosing the entire thing in an incubator slash refrigerator. So I'm using um, a thermal electric cooling array. So the idea is if I want to speed up, you know, reactions that are going on inside Celerator, I can control the temperature. Now, if I want to inhibit, you know, functions, then I can cool off. It's not very energy efficient using the tech, but it, it's an idea that I like having the ability to incubate and cool all in one unit. Um, here is the, um, this is the uh, gantry that I stole from um, open source ecology. They have the, the D3D um, 3D printer. And so this is their, um, gantry system. It's very robust. It's very, um, I like it because it's, you know, very, uh, uh, what do you call it? Plug and play. So here's my evolution that I have for my telescoping arms. The first generation had um, a Z-axis that went outside. Um, same with the second generation. Now the third generation, I've been using um, an array of um, slide rails which I can get uh, telescopic. So the idea is, is that I wanted to have like a nested three stage um, arm. So that gives me ability to move within Celerator with high objects. So if I have a bioreactor, which is really tall, then the idea is, is that I can pull up the Z axis, but I can navigate in between things. Um, my question for the group is this, has anyone seen anything like a telescopic arm that's, you know, you know, right now mine's low budget, which I love. Um, but has anyone seen anything in the ballpark that's anything close to that? Um, I did try this nesting kind of, um, if you look at the bottom right, the little red box, that's a cutaway view. Uh, NASA came up with this design years ago. Um, I, I couldn't get it to work just because the the uh, tolerances that are needed for the uh, the lead screw. But um, version three is working. It's um, not my finest work, but it's to be expected. Um, so there's that. Um, so the Biohack Academy bench tools, um, I bought an industrial laser so I could start making these and producing them. I have been um, hacking these bench tools and adding a little bit more functionality. First things first is I like to give it um, more safety features. I switched the um, Arduino for an ESP32 on most of these, and then I'm giving it um, Safety features, oh, let's go to the next one. So tool upgrades. So I've been upgrading the tools. Um, one thing I do is, is that I define if it's a bench tool or a hand tool. So a bench tool is something that's stationary. A hand tool is something that moves around a 3D space. Um, I give everything a QR code. Um, I've been using ESP32s because what I like about it is, is I can use it with Celerator or I can use it without it. So it's a standalone idea. And then I've also add um, RJ11 ports to it so I can communicate with each one of these bench tools over I squared C. Um, this is just an explanation of what the difference is between a hand tool and a bench tool. Um, all of them have um, I squared C bus. They all have, um, bench tools actually have 120 volts and I'll get to that in just a second. So if you wanna power your bioreactor or your centrifuge drop a 120, it definitely works that way. Um, the um, 
the incubator slash um, cooler is considered to be a bench tool, even if it's on the outside of the device. So I can control all of these symphony of devices through um, cell accelerators, you know, scripting language. So here are the bench tools, a centrifuge on the left. This is Biohack Academy. Um, on the right is a polarimeter that I created. Um, both of these have RJ11 um, ports on the back. So I can just plug in a phone, phone line into that and that will go straight to Accelerator's array. Um, here's a hand tool. So this is the, um, the pipette that I created. Um, right now it's plastic. Um, I, I have uh, some glass um, syringes that I've been using. And my idea is, is using um, the tips, <clears throat> glass tips, and re pretty much boiling in between reactions. The, you know, sterility is a huge part in molecular biology, but I haven't cracked that nut yet. If anyone has any solutions to that, I'm more than eager to hear your solutions for this. But um, this pipette is very accurate and it's $5. So right there, I think that kind of across the board, you know, is, is fantastic. My idea for cutting costs, it's slow and steady. It's not an open trons, but yet, you know, the lead screw is very accurate for depositing um, small amounts of water. So each, each device has a QR code. So the QR code helps Accelerator build a 3D environment. So the first QR code um, is the tool name. Then you have the version. You have the tool size. You have the width, the height, and the length. Um, in red, you have the access ports, and that's uh, determined by an X, Y, and Z location inside the 3D space. Um, there's a URL link for, um, for drivers, manuals, and the code bank for said tool. So once again, it's all open source. If someone wants to create another device, they're more than apt to do it. And then last is the I2C uh, identifier. Um, so if I have multiple centrifuges on the line, you'll need a, a different um, I squared C identifier for each one. So the idea is the seller writer wanted to have, you know, five centrifuges, you would just have a different, you know, unique identifier for each one. So here is the uh, the current working um, QR code that's on the, uh, the centrifuge. This is a breakdown of what, what it actually looks like. Um, nothing too crazy there. But what it does is, is that it helps build a 3D model of where everything is inside Accelerator. So as the um, robotic arm is moving in 3D space, it uses the camera on board, it snakes through it, scans each one of the QR codes, and then it generates, well, you know, limited combinations, but it builds this 3D model. So you have a QR code generated virtual model. So everything is, you know, highlighted. Um, I've been using a lot of OpenCV to generate these maps. And then um, I can use low quality um, stepper motors because the image processing counters for steps lost. So if I want to find where I am in Accelerator, I don't have to count steps or anything like that. So what I'm just doing is this is looking. Just like a regular technician, I want to go to the centrifuge. I travel to where I think the centrifuge is, and I can look at it and verify with a QR code. Um, hey, so James. Yeah. The, the 3D model part is that I I'm it might have I've been in the uh in that uh information block that comes in the QR code, but uh you, you've encoded the dimensions of the piece of lab. Each, yeah. So when you first build your own um bench tool, the idea is that you'll put those dimensions there and it will generate the barcode or the QR code. And then you'll fix that to the top. And um I'm using OpenCV to find the the dimensions of where the QR code is in reference to the bench tool. So then it will reference that. So it will self-calibrate um, where it's at. So um, I, I couldn't figure out another way because everyone's going to do something different. Mm -hmm. um, my example is like 3D printers. If someone has a different nozzle than someone else, you have a different slicer. And this is my version of, you know, if I have a protocol and I share it with Scott or if I share it with Yoni, the idea is that if your setup's different, you know, you'll get the same results because it's following the slicer versus version on your hardware base. So if you have, you know, a super chilled, you know, centrifuge and I have a regular um, a biohack academy centrifuge, you know, depending on what the, the tolerances are in, you know, max RPMs and whatever, you can actually, you know, follow the same script. Does it need to be longer um, in the centrifuge? Does it need to be cooled and whatnot? But, so are you having a standardized deck 
so like when it reads the QR code, it's also knowing the position on the deck. Correct. So there's global variables. So once it scans it, um, if you look at this, um, once it scans the deck, because it does it at the very beginning of each experiment. So let's say that someone just plugs in a brand new um, a mini drop ion in, in it. So the idea is, is it will scan the environment and it will say, oh, look, what is this? It's very new. And now it will have access to hijack that tool. Um, and it doesn't, it's not based off of um, uh, a, a specific location. So as long as my code, which we'll get to later, says, you know, do a, um, a DNA sequence, it, it already knows the global, you know, information from the original scan of the um, environment. Mm -hmm. So I, I actually um, had a, a biorobotics microarray robot um, is already picked apart a little bit, uh, donated to the lab. And so I pulled it apart to really better understand how it was put together and uh, uh, salvage parts from it, uh, some amazing linear actuators. Um, but it had like a, um, a, a, a cold storage unit that had uh, plates around it where I guess they, they pumped a um, cryo um, fluid through to keep the um, the um, SMB plates, you know, maybe 96 well plates or whatever um, chilled. And then it had a little arm that would go in, um, grab a plate based on the barcode, uh, pull it out, uh, the lid would lift off and then it'd come through and pick the samples. Um, uh, I'm wondering if you're thinking about having something like that that can be attached to it. So I have a, um, so any kind of bench tool that you can imagine will work in there as long as you write the code, you know, yeah. I want to make it sort of like a 3D printer where you're just like, hey, I just want to bake this pie and it just runs. Yeah. Um, now I have a smart, um, a smart plate. So it's a heating and cooling plate. It has a built-in scale to it. So it can, um, if I want to boil water on it, or if I want to um, do a weight calibration or something like that, I have that, but it's based off healthy airs. So if I wanted to get super cold, I could. I mean, that's the same thing with the um, the PCR machine, but having a, a built-in refrigerator, I love the idea. Um, and that's why I made it super expendable. So any kind of bench tool that you can envision, um, I mean, ideally, I've been working on this to make proteins for tissue engineering. That's my background. Um, but for me to put this into my kitchen and to make, you know, my toaster a, a bench tool and make a, you know, I have an automated kitchen. I, I love this idea. And I don't know, you know, um, the, the future of this, but I'm, I'm working on one thing at a time. But um, yeah, cooling is one of the, 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 the toughest issues that I've figured out with this, that and sterilization. Um, but yeah. So there's um I can I can actually take some images of the parts. Uh please, and, please send yeah. them my way. Yep, yep. Yeah. Cheers. One question that I have related also is that you you're using um you're using vision to solve this problem mm -hmm. to try to use the vision to see where it is. So you can it, actually get like from I don't know. Um, you can connect with those equipments and have a server related to each of them and say the position of them, right? Like the the space. The, but I, I'm I'm not sure if you are using vision to say this had X, Y, and Z, and it is thirty inch, thirty each inches from the board. Um, of the space, right? That that's what you're doing. Correct, correct. So the yeah. idea is is that um, using G code, you want to have you know exact positioning. Well, the problem is is that with exact positioning, you need either a um, an encoder on your stepper motors, mm -hmm. and that goes from a three dollar stepper motor to a ten dollar stepper motor. It's not a it's not a big expense, but I want these in every you know high school on the planet. You know, I want it in you know third world countries. So my my you know a twelve dollar camera that can self correct location with lost steps um, mm -hmm. was the paramount you know um, cameras are getting cheaper and cheaper every revision of this um, so once again yeah I, I yeah that was that was the main goal is just solving problems but the camera is 
something that we all have, which is vision, right? So as a laboratory mm -hmm. technician, all of us, you know, who are pipetting and doing all this, um, having the ability to take a picture of your project in progress and, and put it in your laboratory notebook, that's a, I'll show you that in a few slides, but that's one of the main appeals of having this. Um, nice. Okay, so yeah, um, back to the I squared C uh, tool commands. I made it very simple and I made it plain English. So the idea is the noun verb and then comments. So the idea is centrifuge open, um, centrifuge close, centrifuge, you know, 510 minutes. So, you know, that would be 5,000 would be your RPMs and 10 M is your, um, is your time duration. And so the idea is, is that um, very simple. This traffic is actually sniffed and that's put, that's also tracked in the um, laboratory notebook. So if I said, you know, PCR for 15 minutes, then, you know, that code is sent over and that's automatically added to the laboratory notebook. So there's that. Um, keep it simple. So there's that. Um, so here is my, um, my PNS, my peripheral nervous system. So um, high power devices and data communication is, you know, a huge bioreactor sucking up a whole bunch of juice um, and having three of them in accelerator is going to be a problem. So my solution to this is the PNS, which is a power distribution network. Each one of these um, outlets is connected to um, mains and I can control it through accelerator. Um, this device is actually considered a bench tool as well, but it has higher priority of anything else. Um, each one of these devices, uh, each one of your bench tools will connect via the phone jack from the bench tool to the uh, PNS, and that will send the commands um, on the I squared C bus. And then the mains is controlled by a relay. So if I want to turn on the bioreactor, the question is, is there enough power on the system to support the bioreactor? So that means that if I want to go on a marathon sprint, you know, rest and rest and digest versus, you know, going out on a full sprint. So the idea is this will control all power. It also manages um, voltage and current draw, so it will never trip your circuit breaker. So the idea is if you ever have a toaster oven and your microwave on the same line and you try to run them at the same time and you trip the circuit breaker, this is to prevent that. So the idea is like, hey, I want my toast and I want my popcorn. However, I have to do one and then the next one. So this is a priority system. Um, right now, um, the reason why this is right, here's my question for the group. Right now, I have this sort of as a box that's mounted to the wall inside Celerator. And the idea is, is that all the devices will be snaked through wires to plug into this with their live power and their um, mains and their uh, data protocol. But the question is, is that would it be better to plug it in into the base? rather than having some kind of yeah I, don't know. I i hate the nest of uh, wires with the open trons um it's all outside the deck okay uh, but yeah if you can have some kind of um connector device that um when you add the tool it just slots in and connects uh, so, so that that's a problem yeah, that's a problem cool. I'm currently trying to address. Um, mm -hmm. They just came out with this new system called the Gridfinity. I don't know if you've seen it um, on the internet. It's a 3D printed organizing system. It has like these little magnets. And I don't know, I, I like the idea of bench tools, sort of like um, uh, PCI cards where you just plug it in and it just like works. Um, but th this is what's handling my power management and data you know, um, traffic. So, um, yeah, if, if I can hand, if I can fix power, then, you know, that's on my to-do list. Um, so I like bio, um, inspired design. So the entire system runs off a of raspberry Pi. Um, unlike most people, I had a couple left over during the, the lockdown. So I was able to work on accelerator a lot. Um, the servo and the cameras, the optic nerve, um, those are powered, um, are, and run directly to the, um, to the GPIO pins of the Raspberry Pi. So it has um, the ability to look three, uh, 180 degree sweep. Um, so if you're just looking down, that's fine, but you can look to the left or to the right in increments in between. Um, let's see, the Arduino um, is the CNS or the um, cerebellum, which controls all movement of Celerator. Um, once again, cost. You know, I could use a ramps board and I can use a smoothie soft, I can use all these things 
But, you know, this isn't going to help someone, you know, in a third world developing nation that wants to do molecular biology. So once again, everything is trying to nickel and dime everything out. Um, I have a solid state hard drive. This is um, where the electronic laboratory notebook lives. Um, all images, all video, um, everything outside of the, the operating system. And then you have uh, the PNS, um, which we just discussed. So here's the software architecture. Um, I have an embedded design um, contact who I'll probably uh, switch over to um, to that in the future. But with my skill sets, this is what I'm currently um, cobbling together. So you have the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Um, you have the VNC so I can dial it in from my computer. Um, Apple NetTalk for file management. There's a native lap stack on it. So what that is, it's, it's um, Linux, uh, Apache, my, uh, it's Maria um, database and PHP. So the laboratory notebook, which we'll get to, is published in real time and you can see it anywhere in the world. So if you have accelerator in, you know, Georgia and you have accelerator in New York and you have accelerator in, you know, BioCurious, you can just dial in and see exactly what it's doing in real time through its laboratory notebook. Um, Python standard OpenCV, very important to a lot of the processes. Um, so then we have Python scripts that are based off of the CNS and the PNS, um, the central nervous system and the, the peripheral nervous system. And so those are just Python scripts that kind of handle this symphony and everything's stitched together with a graphic um, software called Zojo. Um, so Zojo is under development right now. I mean, not the Zojo, but the, the graphic user interface. It's kind of, it works, but you have to have a degree in computer programming. So I'm making it kind of pretty right now. And then um, everything talks over serial to um, run the, the G code on the um, Arduino. Okay, uh, Accelerator has its own scripting language. So I call it DAVAR. So it's do, device, action, verify, and record. So once again, I wanted to keep it as simple as possible for everyone to use. So um, do is belongs to the hand, the eye, or anything global action. And then device is either hand tool or bench tool. So if I want to say um, device is going to be the pipette, and the action is, you know, pipette, you know, five micrograms to destination. Um, so that's the do and the action. The verify, now verify and record, um, are, are built in automatically, but the idea is, is that um, you can change these functions if you would like. So verify is, I need to uh, centrifuge this at 5,000 um, RPM. Well, the centrifuge has a built-in tachometer, and so the idea is, is that if it verifies that, then it will record that in an electronic laboratory notebook. So instead of having, yes, it was done, now you'll have a curve based off of um, plot trends. So when you first spin it up, you're not at um, 5,000 RPM, you have to gradually get there. So that will be a ramp curve to your plateau. And then ideally there will be a ramp down. Um, the reason for that is if someone has a different centrifuge, these can control both of these ramp times. So if your centrifuge is different than person B, it's not changing the centrifuge, it's changing the, the graph of the RPM over time. So ideally this is all for, um, reproducibility and accountability. And lastly is record. So every step in um, Accelerator is record to the electronic, uh, the laboratory notebook, and it's just done in real time. There's no ifs, ands, or buts, it just does it. Um, I have found experiments in my you know career, and I was just like, how did I do that? You know, I want to re reproduce this, and I can't. And that is a failure on so many parts. So, um, so that was that. So you, everything is recorded into a, um, sign, um, let's see, data method using a JSON file, data structured, and the laboratory notebook, everything's in PHP. Um, there is a database for plot collection. Um, images and videos are also saved from the camera and everything's backed up to Accelerator itself on the local. Um, I have a, PH, uh, a Python script that uses um, OS, uh, OSF, Open Source Foundations. Um, I guess it's sort of like a Google Drive, but it's for science projects. So that is synced. So you'll never lose your data. Even if Accelerator dies, your backup is on OSF. And um, there's a German um, biotorrent.d 
DE. So once again, if you want to share and distribute your collective knowledge, a portion of the solid, uh, the hard drive is for torrents. So if someone else creates something, it's sort of a duplication of effort because I don't want anything to be lost. I, I want to be able, hey, I want to do this experiment. While you're using the, the experimenter creator, it will look and see if anyone's even gotten close to this. And then so it will auto-propagate you know, the, the protocol as you go. Um, here's an example of the accelerator scripting language. So if I do centrifuge, um, I can specify centrifuge two, um, and then I can say, you know, what are we, you know, centrifuging a sample? Um, what is the RPMs? And then what is the time duration? Now, this is the only information that's mandatory. If you didn't have the two, it would default as of right now to uh, centrifuge one. And then it goes, um, now we have the verify, which is RPM equals 10,000 at 10 minutes. So that means it wants it at 10 minutes at 10,000 RPMs. So that means that all of the, the speed up and slow down isn't you know, counted in that. And then the record is the RPM over time. So once again, that's just a graph. So, James, Go on. Yeah. I'm wondering for that example of the centrifuge, another parameter would be temperature potentially. Um, yeah. So, so you know, eventually there might be these refrigerated centrifuges, and and yeah. so um, I think that would be a parameter to kind of work into it. Well, so the um, so the incubator slash cooler is a bench tool itself, and that's a global variable as well. So the um, the we'll just call it the incubator. The incubator has um, sensors on it. It has light, temperature. Um, so it can change RGBW, um, it will do, I want to hook up one of those CO2 gas tanks from like the um, soda stream or whatever, so I can control CO2 in the chamber. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But the idea is, is that if temperature is, it's also being recorded as an environmental uh, variable through the laboratory notebook. But you're, you're correct, if there is a centrifuge with a, uh, a temperature sensor, that will definitely, you know, have a, a parameter as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I'm thinking that, um, you know, many cases you'll want to centrifuge at uh, four degrees, but, um, you know, you do like setups at uh, room temperature. Yeah. Um, yeah. Has, has anyone have seen a, um, a DIY <laughs> refrigerated centrifuge? I mean, I've looked, I haven't. Yeah, that's sort of like a unicorn right there. But yeah. I think I think with the popular, I, I assume with popularity of this very cheap molecular biology kit, people would start creating all sorts of bench tools and hand tools for it. Um, let's see, next slide. Hey, okay, so here's lines, some- James. Yeah. Sorry to, to go back to it, no. but um, uh, you were talking about um, sort of variations in the actual equipment and like, how do you normalize that? So like your ramp speed might be different or something like that. Uh, and if we're talking about some arbitrary centrifuge, um, how do you handle the calibration on that? Because like the accelerator is not going to know about it, but like, does the centrifuge have a way to know to tell accelerator, hey, I'm calibrated this way and I have to have this ramp speed? Like, how do you, yes. how do you think so, about so that? So I have a, um, so accelerator has a, uh, what is the file called? It's sort of like a function check. So um, when you first install a new, a new tool to accelerator, what it'll do is it will function check each part of that um, script. So let's say that you're doing a PCR machine. So the very first thing it says is, okay, can the PCR machine open? And then it does that function check and that saves it into its calibration file. And then it, it will do a, a temperature ramp map and it will save all of that to, you know, I should, that's a good idea. I should save that to um, the laboratory notebook. Because right now it's just, uh, um, I have a file that's all the global variables of, of, you know, this is the centrifuge, this is where it's located in X, Y, and Z, here's its access ports. And then it, there's another file that says centrifuge was calibrated on this date. Um, but I should add that to laboratory notebook. Um, so right now, this is sort of like, I was spending $1,200 a week on collagenase. And, you know, I didn't want, I was flushing it down the toilet because I was just running an experiment. And I was like, if I made my own, you know, I, I don't want, you know, laboratory grade. I just want, you know, throw in the garbage grade. And I, I think that's what this is. This machine is like, it will get you close enough. Um, but, you know, it's it's no, you know, open trons. It's no, um, you know, it's a toy. But I, I wanted a, a toy that's very competent. And I think as more people adopt this toy, it will get, um, 
better and better bench tools, better than what I can make. You know, um, I'm, I'm just a monkey, you know, hitting a keyboard. And so, um, but yeah, exactly. Um, let's see. So here's um, my last slide, I think. This is uh, exper uh, external uh, Python functions. So everything is attached to an ORCID ID. So that is your um, signature. So let's say that you have it in your, um, in your university lab. The idea is that your PI will sign into the machine and that's theirs. But let's say one of the, you know, the postdocs want to use it as well, they'll sign in it as well. So everything's logged to your um, ORCID ID and everything's logged that way. So I can, you know, for traceability and accountability and all this. So if someone's, you know, making crystal meth with it, I really want to know that, you know, James Parsons is actually the one who's signed to it. Now, yeah, of course, someone's going to steal your username and do all this other stuff. Um, but I like it. It's like 16 bits long. It's easily, you know, used in everything. Um, OSF likes you to sign in with it. So that, that's another, you know, connective um, step. Um, I want to do, I haven't implemented this yet, but after the experiment's complete, um, I have some tools for analyzing the data that's collected. I want to be able to one-click publish to PubPub. Um, <clears throat> BioTorrents is linked with all of the, um, all the collected data. I believe data should belong uh, to, to, the, to the populace, but I believe that the um, analysis should belong to the, the users. So, you know, if I create, you know, something and I've done all of the hard work, I think that belongs to you. Um, SciFind, I want to have a social aspect to this that I was thinking about implementing. So if I wanted to really like um, ask a question to the community or an experiment, I want to publish it somewhere where people of like mind and like backgrounds can observe this. So I think sci-fi might be a good extension. And also, you know, hooking it up to experiment.com. So if someone says, hey, is there any funding for this thing? Um, th these are all uh, things that I'm trying to work on in the future. Now, the reason this red is, is there anything that I'm missing that people want functionality or you know, APIs that can connect to something else. No, okay. I mean, well, I'm not, I'm not familiar with all of these. I, I think I have some yeah. research to do on some of them, but, uh, you know, uh, I've, I've never really loved protocols.io, but like a thing that does that mm -hmm. kind of thing, maybe one of these does, that's just like, oh, I would like to be able to look up a, you know, I don't know, uh, uh, a golden gate assembly method or something. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. And then be like, oh, here's, you know, someone did this and they got these results and that's kind of cool. Okay. I could try to hack on that. Um, does sound useful. Yeah. I, I, I love it. I love it. So let me add protocols that I owe. I was actually thinking about that. Um, yeah. And I kind of worry about, um, uh, some of these companies, um, you know, they offer free access, free services, um, but um, how good is their business model to how sustainable is it? So I always worry about if I store stuff there, you know, and the company goes under, um, what happens to it? Or they get taken over by another company that wants to extract as much money as possible out of users. Uh, that, that, think, that's why I have the triple redundancy. I have your, your local machine. I've got the, the torrents for, you know, distributed. And then I also have, OSF or Google Drive or something else, right? It's just like redundancy on months, redundancy on months, redundancy. So if one of them, if Google ever goes away, <laughs> you know, you'll still have it local and you'll still have it, you know, somewhere else. You know, Kobe just wrote in the chat, what about using GitHub? I think that's kind of a nice idea. GitHub. I like it. I like it a lot. So once again, I, it's all open source. So if anyone watch, wants to write a Python script that you know, add some feature, does all this other stuff. Um, I have some ideas for the future. I want to sell downtime. I think that will be kind of interesting if someone says, hey, I'm doing this experiment. I need growth factors. Can you make them for me because your machine is running down? Um, so I think there might be a, a protein exchange or something like that. Um, let me show you. I'm going to share my screen and show. Um, let's see. Share, new share. This is, okay, so this is the laboratory manual. We're uh, the seeing ELN. the same slide, James. Oh, you're seeing the same slide? Okay, I'll see that one and Maybe share. just stop and start again. Oh, there you go. Okay, I see it. Okay. 
So um, on the left is a list of all the experiments that have been run. I have a seven drop test where I use the pipette to drop, you know, seven uh, sequentially smaller drops onto a onto a plate, and then I have the grow E. coli. And this is very rudimentary, but the idea is, is that everything is just done. Um, I don't know why my pictures aren't loading up right now, um, but yeah. So there's that. Um, close out of this and then I think my goal is right now is that I try to submit it the version alpha on um, hackaday.io back in 2020 um I'm, I'm thinking about doing the um the hackaday io this year for 2023 with my beta version because I I've abandoned Arduinos for ESP 32s um let me show let me share my screen with um share okay um this is sort of like the the rough um login page when everyone does anything first you have your users there's a drop down um you have your um orchid id number you can also create a new user from there um then it does a vir virtual lab of what it's going on so it shows you all your tools in real time uh it draws it right on the screen um, I've changed this now use OpenCV and actually show you a picture of the tools rather than just a 3D drawing of it. It gives you a list of all the tools on the side and it lets you generate, you know, the contents that are inside of that tool um, that works for hand tools and bench tools. Um, let me think. Um, th this is an experiment calendar. Um, I think this is going to be switched off to a, um, a Gantt chart. So the idea is, is with power management and downtime and, hey, this needs to incubate for, you know, 35 minutes, um, you have a lull, so something else can be happening during that time. Um, this is beyond my pay grade. I've, I've been dabbling with it, but it's kind of a um, three-dimensional problem. Um, let me see. I kind of like the idea of a design experiment, but um, once again, I don't want to go into the weeds. I just want... Um, everything's nested. So if I say that I just want to centrifuge, you know, this sample, it has all of the nested, you know, um, extra, uh, ex extrapolated um, steps before that. So open the lid, put the sample in, close the lid, verify it. So there's a, a nine degree freedom sensor on top of the lid. So that will tell you, you know, how um, level and how shaky it is if the lid's opening. So all of these things are all baked in like a breakdown of that one, you know, command is centrifuge specimen. And I believe over time, people will get better and better and write, um, let's say, a heat shock protocol. And we've been using the same heat shock protocol forever. However, if someone says, oh, by the way, if you do one tap against the wall, you get a 50% yield or, you know, better results, then I think that should trickle down into all the other protocols in the future. Um, uh, experiment designer, uh, peer review. I, I don't know how to work that in. I was thinking something like how the Google Drive has um, where you can comment on the side and whatnot. But I want people of like of your caliber to look over my work and make sure it's like, hey, this doesn't make any sense. Or why did you do it this way? Instead of doing that, you should try this. And I think that will make it more dynamic as well. Um, laboratory notebook, it, it loads the sample right into the um, I'll show you the, the work in real time. Um, this is my G-code debugger built in. Uh, here's a picture of version one from the top. It's just showing, you know, this is my um, polarimeter on the right, and there's just a, uh, a vial on the left. And that's about it. Oh, um, I'm using a um, rack and pinion on the... Um, inside accelerator. So my design is, is I can make it so you can stack multiple left, um, left or right. So you can have a longer volume. I don't know if that's a, you know, low hanging fruit or if that's a, a need, but if you're running out of space, rather than buying an entire new accelerator, you're just buying more volume um, at a fraction of the cost. So um, yeah, please ask questions. I, I my, my slides over, um, I'll give it over to our, our leader, Tim. 
Uh, any questions for James? Thanks, James. Actually, let's give uh, James a little round of applause. Your snaps, your your clap. Yeah, it's awesome. This is really cool. Um, I, I mean, I have a question to lead off. I mean, usually with all these, uh, you know, open source projects, I, I think one of the most important questions is, um, you know, who's in the tent? Uh, you know, so so who do you envision and who do you want working on this? Is it, you know, uh, sort of a project you want to gift out there and then people do stuff? Or do you imagine more core developers? Um, how are you thinking yeah. about development? Yeah, so um, I, I've just been, I just built my shop to start manufacturing these in-house. Um, I'd like to sell them, but I also like people to like bake them them themselves at home. If you if I can't keep up with demand or supply short, I want everyone to jump on board. Um, once again, I think I want to cure cancer. I'm not going to be able to do it, but giving everyone the tools to do it, I think that's paramount. Um, when I got when I graduated, for me to build my own home lab that will do you know 90% of accelerator, you're looking at 30k, and I was like, well, I can't afford that. You know, uh, I just graduated, but. 3K might be reasonable, you know, um, I don't know. Um, I'm trying to make it as cheap and affordable for anyone on the planet. Um, a lot of 3D printed parts and um, yeah, so. And I, I like think, I like the on. idea that it's extensible that, um, you know, people can build their own things and hopefully those people will open source their designs. Um, but, it, you know, you create a real ecosystem to it. I, I think sort of like um, the sound cards and the graphics cards of the early 80s and 90s, you know, those are people tinkering in their garage. And now you've got like NVIDIA and you've got AMD and, you know, they just spawned from, you know, a platform that they just jumped on board and made something for it. Yeah, it's not open source, but um, yeah, I, I want everyone, you know, I want um, uh, the, the Oxford Nanopore to make a, you know, a slip for this. I want a Kilobaser to make a, a bench tool for this. I want everyone to build a bench tool for it. Um, and this, I'm also thinking about, um, you know, those cloud labs, um, where yep, it's Emerald, essentially yep. a wall of instrumentation and they're moving from one place. So this is kind of like a mini cloud lab. Um, so I, I wonder if in your design, you know, um, uh, you know, I used to ride a motorcycle in Australia. And um, when you ride a motorcycle, you become a much better driver. You tend to look six cars ahead. Um, and and I, I'm always telling people, don't just look at the car in front of you. Um, uh, but I, I, I think, you know, if you can kind of build in to make this flexible enough so that, you know, maybe multiple units of this can interplay and work together to do different stages of some kind of production. Or if you have some kind of a cloud lab where different people are ac accessing it, um, you don't have just the one one device. Oh, I, I totally agree. Um, well, I, I said earlier that I was you know, spending a grand a week on collagenase. If I had a machine like this that was just pooping it out every week, you know, what if I had 15 of them in my lab, each one of them making one um, growth factor, one protein, one enzyme. And then I was just, you know, hey, I, I go to go back to the machine and grab it. Um, yeah, I, I think startups in the future, you know, like everyone at an incubator right now, the first purchase is like a 3D printer and then they start prototyping, right? I, I kind of see Celerator fit in that kind of, you know, package as everyone, oh, I, you know, I just got a hundred million dollars for my startup and let's go buy 15 Celerators. Um, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I hope it changes the world and cures cancer. That's my goal. But if it makes me, you know, breakfast in the morning, so be it, you know, it's, um, yeah. Cool. So, um, yeah, I think I'm going to start off with making bench tools and, um, I have a, I just bought a website and I'm trying to get it all up and running. Once the bench tools are in the ecosystem, then I'll start, you know, inching my way towards Celerator that will include all those that you can, hey, I already have the bench tools. Let's just throw those in a automation machine. So. Uh, to that end, um, is there a sort of central place for us to go to, to look at this? Um, a repository or, you know, even just a website? Yeah, yeah there's um, Celerator on GitHub. Um, if you go to the, the SSL isn't installed yet on my website, but it's, um, uh, cell11.com. Um, I think there's a sign up right now for it. If you guys just want to sign up for our, my monthly um, uh, newsletters, it's just an update. My investors want to have, you know, updates and know what everything's going on. So, um, so there's that. 
but yeah, hopefully hackaday.io works out for me and then um, we can start bringing them into the, into the world. Um, yeah. If anyone knows anyone that like is a mechanical engineer or has, you know, ideas or please send them my way. I, you know, I'll, I'll talk to anyone. But um, yeah, this is my um, my passion project for the last like five years, and I've just been doing it on nights and weekends, so I'm just cobbling it together. Cool. Yeah, are you um are, are you uh, uh expanding out to? I mean, do you imagine you're doing this full time? Yeah, um, that that's the goal. I actually quit most of my jobs. I have a couple of clients left, but yeah, I bought a new space, fabrication and facility, uh, and that's the idea. The idea is I want to you know, sell bench tools, sell hand tools and sell accelerators and see what happens, fingers crossed. But um, yeah, probably give it, you know, another six months of me tinkering before I have everything up and running, but yeah. James, can you uh, type your um, URL in the chat? Yeah, I lost my chat. Give me a second, where did it go? It hides, it hides from you. Here, I, don't know. Uh, I got it pulled up right there. Um, yeah, you see your security thing, right? Because it gave me an error. But then once I was like, oh, it's fine. It, it let me. Yeah. Know. Yeah. So SSL from GoDaddy is like $200 for three years or something like that. And if you use a free one, but GoDaddy won't let you, you know, sign in with their free version. So. <sighs> yeah. I, I tell people to avoid GoDaddy. Yeah. They're the biggest advertisers and. Uh, uh, if you don't mind a cheaper Canadian alternative, there's whc.ca and w uh, w c h c w h c .ca. And, Okay, I'm gonna uh, check that out. Uh, you know, they, you know, Google had their um, oh, what was it called? Their free SSL thing that they've been pushing. You know, mm -hmm. SSL everywhere, and uh, you know, uh, the cheaper ones have put that in. I, I can't stand GoDaddy and you know Bluehost. I, I I do a lot of web development for my clients, and you know if they're floating the bill, that's fine. But yeah, yeah. When, when I'm paying it out of my own pocket, I'd rather you know. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So, is there anything that people want to see in this? Is there anything? It's like I, I assume everyone wants to beta test it once it's ready. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm kind of excited about the whole thing, um, yeah. and you know, I'll I'll uh, I, I know I've got a bunch of photos from way back when I pulled the thing apart, but I'll um, dig those out and share them with you. Uh, I've got a a major rush job work wise, so it'll probably be um, uh, this weekend or or a bit later uh, before I can get to it. But uh, yeah, it's cool. Your whole project. Cool guys, cool. Um, uh, Keone says that uh, I squared C gets um, quite unreliable over long, uh, longer distances. Now, my rate right now is about three to ten feet. What kind of distances were you talking about? Uh, well, so I had that experience too, and um, I'm talking about like fifty centimeters, uh, maybe less. Um, yeah. And you're having issues with it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it has a lot to do with noise on the circuit. So um, yeah. The big one that we had was we were using I squared C to talk to a tiny little uh, LCD screen. And that was over a run of, oh, I mean, yeah, 50 centimeters or so. Um, and uh, it also was pulling power. I think it was five volt, but it might have been more. Um, and it just started spitting garbage. And then we would we, we swapped it for a very, very short run and it was fine. Uh, mm -hmm. the, so we've turned to everything that's off of a chip. Um, so like, like if it's literally on a printed circuit board, then it's probably fine. But everything else, uh, we moved to RS-485, um, which is, um, it, it uses noise canceling because it's two wire. So it, it uh, removes noise and that's rated for hundreds of feet. Um, so it's, it's sort of trivial. And at first I was like, ah, really? We got to get into RS-485? That's so like industrial and in the weeds. Um, and I've learned to love it. So, um, so, so you love it. So, cause, cause I, that was a problem that I was having was that as more people expand the accelerators, you know, having that kind of long line, I haven't done a lot of testing with my data protocol yet. I mean, it works on one-offs and whatnot, but, um, I'll, I'll have to keep, um, a lookout on RS 45 and see what, yeah, get into it. It's really flexible. And like, once you're kind of over the fear of like, oh my God, I have to think about bits. Um, 
it's actually trivial. It's just a serial um, serial uh, communication platform and and it's addressable. So you can put 10 things on the same circuit and just so long as they know their addresses, it's fine. Gotcha, gotcha. I'll have to look into that. Uh, right now, I squared C is working for me, but we'll see yeah. um, if, if, if it scales. Okay. Okay. I'm just looking, I'm just looking through the notes, um, kind of wire duck goes a long way. Well, I'm going to have to cut us off. Uh, I have to yeah. go right at the top of the hour, but um, let's thank James one more time. And I assume people are, are uh, you'll, you'll take emails from people if they have more to talk about. Yeah, please. E everyone reach out to me. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, you know, email my way. Go, go for it. Great. Well, thanks, guys. Always good to see everyone. And uh, we'll see you next month. Okay.